come. Oh, golly, it's time to do it again. Welcome aboard, Stargazers. Welcome aboard our 120th program, episode number 120, deep into our third year of uh, telecasting, if you will, the SBAU Astro Hour for Santa Barbara, California's longtime club of astronomy and telescopes, just like the old radio days on an AM news talk station would meet every other Monday. My name's Ron Heron, your host. Welcome to the Astro Hour. On YouTube, it's SB Astro Hour. And this is for June 5th through the 11th. It's a Monday morning, episode 120 this hour. We're going to try to cover some interesting topics. It's amazing what's going on in astronomy these days. Going to go there, cover the moon in June. Check out a couple of visible asteroids. One dim, one bright. In fact, uh, one's a dwarf planet. Uh, the variable star of the month sounds like a superhero. Wait till you hear the name of it. It's up near, near the Big Dipper. All kinds of star classifications. We're going to get into that. Uh, be awestruck by the sizes of things like Antares and Betelgeuse. My God. As well as explore. Uh, oh, has Betelgeuse exploded yet? I don't think so. Maybe. We won't know for a while. Well, yeah. we got 600 years to find out if it's because that's where we're looking at it that far back. And something I'm going to take partial credit for because I brought it up a couple of weeks ago on this program about dust and gas and space and doggone if we're not going to talk about that. With the president of the club, the beloved Jerry Wilson, healing from his mump on his head. Hello, Jerry. Good morning. You good morning. Back. You uh, give a thumbs up to this year's Imadinari. Drove your Tesla up there to the mission. Managed to get back up again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and the president. Thank you for hosting the show, for actually being uh, our uh, tele tele guy. What's what sort of like a webmaster? Temporary. No, it's webmaster. not. It has nothing to do with the web, but no. <laughs> I'm okay, just well, a user. Tom, yeah, Tom uh, Totten, we're losing him for a month, aren't we? He's going out of town. Chuck yeah. McPartland is our outreach coordinator. His wife is Pat, the merchandise manager. Jerry Wilson's wife is Pat Forgey. And there on the screen, my screen, among the four of us, uh, is my friend Tom Whittemore, whose wife is Maureen Tom, former Westmont College science instructor, editor of the SBAU newsletter, and a uh, classic sourdough bread maker. Also, our connection to the uh, big Westmont telescope, which is coming up, I think, soon, right, on a Friday night? We do yeah. all these outreach, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the 16th. 16th. Okay. Uh, we also start the hour every time we do the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit Astro Hour with uh, some levity, some silly science cartoons that President Jerry forwards us. And I guess we've culled it down, eliminated a few, but these are sometimes hysterical. Look at this. James Webb made its most amazing discovery yet. Seven white dwarfs in the constellation of Scorpius. Note this. Occasionally one appears to glow red. Okay, I'm trying that. So seven. Oh, is this the uh, sudden brouhaha about uh, having to rewrite the thing on the on the uh, Big Bang? Is this this the, is I'm the not seven sure dwarfs, I follow Ron. that, but no, I'm this sorry. is a mimic. Go ahead. Well, whoever was wants to talk, Chuck. It's the seven dwarfs. That's not <laughs> those seven huge galaxies at the 13 billion no. mile mark. No, it's, it's like this is a cartoon. Mind. This is a cartoon, Ron. It's <laughs> the seven dwarfs, and Bashful is and the one that turns red. Those right. were six. There you go. Okay. The ones that it saw were five or six, I think, wasn't it? Five big, huge galaxies. We're not going to talk about it, but I just want to. Not today. So these are dwarfs. <laughs> we will be talking about dwarf stars later, won't we? So that topic is a work in progress, and there's uh, opinions and hypotheses shooting in all sorts of directions. Yeah. Well, I'm still on YouTube a lot. In fact, we're broadcasting now on YouTube, but man, half yes, the videos are. here, it's all over. And I don't recall getting this one. A couple dogs at the laptop. One tells the other, and then I just uh, get to <laughs> eat. I haven't actually eaten any homework for years. <laughs> for those of you with dogs, yeah. the dog hit my delete button, uh, teacher. Okay, here's the uh, master sitting at his uh, laptop, I assume, talking uh -huh. in-house. Anybody want to read it or shall I? Go ahead. Uh, can you hand me the screwdriver over there? Certainly, Master. Um, master, yes. What does it mean to be human? Is it the flesh and bone? Is it the thing you humans call a soul? Or is it something innate that we machines could never obtain? No way, my boy. It's the ability to select 
all squares with traffic lights in uh, the gotcha mode. What traffic lights are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> all right. I think they uh, really zero in on uh, Teslas. You guys are in uh -huh. trouble. Okay. Somebody's being sucked into a spaceship. And a couple guys are watching. This is a scene deleted <laughs> from uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. They're abducting Jerry, our president. Oh, thank God. The other guy says, I never liked him. Yeah, me neither. And out in space is, or is, is this back on Earth? This is in space. This is where the mm -hmm. aliens take him. They, des they didn't deserve you, Jerry. Welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Not terribly good, but it had my name in it. So yeah, that's true. Resist. Yeah, they have their own SBAU out there. All right. Stuff we know in the pie graph, very, very little. Oh, my God, that's depressing. Stuff you know you don't know is a little bit more, but look at the other 56%. Stuff you don't know that you don't know and we may never know. There's a famous quote by a physicist, famous physicist that I always liked, and it said, the universe is stranger than we know and possibly stranger than we can know. Can know, yeah. I just wonder why religions don't let us when we die and still instead of going to a pleasure palace called heaven, why don't we just cruise the universe and find out what's going on and get to see it forever and ever. And All right, here we go. This is uh, <laughs> comprising uh, how components are made. Yep. <laughs> That's how computers are made. Yeah. Little resistors are swimming <laughs> toward that. Uh, uh, what is that? A transistor? D a D -amp. D it's yeah. an op. Oh, it's 741. A DIP. Yeah. Okay, it's a microchip, right? Yeah. Here is Neil the Grass Titan. <laughs> I wonder if he's seen this one. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Neil. <laughs> that's true. It's a new transformer that's out in the. There's another thing you did about grass. Actually, it was about corn. Maybe you eliminated oh, yeah, yeah. it. I think that's in here too. All right, we have Charles Dickens versus Erwin Schrodinger. Dickens said, "You know, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times." And Schrodinger said. Yeah, kind of nice. Nice. Okay. There's if you're a scientist, <laughs> you know how that that's and here's a look at the rovers on Mars as depicted by the Disney Imagineers, including uh, the Ingenuity Copter on the left. <laughs> right below it, barfing out, I guess Dragon Breath is uh what's the name of it? Uh, per, uh, Perseverance. Curiosity is the one that had the laser. Yeah, this oh, is, is that the one? Yeah. yeah. Why would it have a laser? What's it trying to do? The bird things. Oh, okay. In case there were any ants up there. Yeah. <laughs> so are, are there five or four? This is the Sojourner, the very first one. Okay. So, and they're all they're all over the planet. They're scattered everywhere. Scattered around. Yeah. This is the, uh, the they, these two you see have nuclear reactors on the back end. And these three uh, run on solar power. I thought I remembered them not not uh, launching nuclear because it might crash into the earth and spread radioactivity everywhere. Is that? They're, no. They have they're run by RTGs, which just have a little tiny bit of plutonium in, plutonium in them. But yeah, there was there was all kinds of flap and squawk about launching those. But they've the, been doing that for decades. The well, populace has a, a, a knee jerk emotional response to the word nuclear and radiation. Who does? What was the, the populace in general? Um, oh, the populace, the people. Yeah, I, I think that engineering nuclear stuff is completely safe nowadays. Well, the, maybe you saw in the news recently, there's a lot of stuff left over up, up at Hanford in Washington. Where yes, they, they didn't build things very well at no. first. They weren't well engineered. And uh, that's the waste. Sort of, that, those are waste products from nuclear fission, which are really hard to get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> When you say waste, uh, it's radiating, but would it be hot to hold? If you could hold that uh, plutonium yeah. in your hand, would it be he heated? Would it be? If, if you get enough of it together, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the whole point of it. Mar uh, Marie Curie died of radium poisoning on her hands. Uh, her hands were blistered when she died. Remember that? By hand? Well, she had a tumor in her chest from a locket she wore that contained radium. Oh, no kidding. Wow. So they didn't, didn't appreciate radiation the rest, of us, the rest of us are going to die with our cell phones on our yeah. ears there was my there uncle, was a whole uh, cohort of ladies in france i believe it was that um died young from various cancers because they worked in watch factories and they used to put tritium on the um numerals on the watches so that they would glow at night so you could see them and the way they applied it was with a little paintbrush 
Oh, but they used don't. to lick the paintbrush to get a point on it, and then they would paint on the tritium, and it killed a whole lot of people. Wow. Give them, they died of tongue cancer or whatever. Oh, yeah. a, good mm. Lord. I miss those kind of watches. I like to be able to see them in the dark, but nevertheless. Mm -hmm. Well, my Anybody uncle used to had, had some um, retirement land up at Hanford. He owned what is now the Hanford reactor site. And during World War II, he received a letter from the Defense Department thanking him for selling the land. <laughs> is, is that uh, compound east of the, the Cascades or west where the woods are? I'm oh, just curious. It's, it's out in the flat, the arid part. It's on the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it'd be uh, east, Al mm -hmm. yeah, east um, of the Cascades. Spokane, Spokane. <laughs> All right, are we done with? Oh no, a couple of scientists are at the blackboard. There we go. One of them says to the other, "Okay, this <laughs> takes out an old adage." Yes, yes, I know that, Sydney. Everybody knows that. But look here: four wrongs squared minus two wrongs to the fourth power divided by this formula do make a right. <laughs> Sounds like. Part of Dr. Uh, Antonucci's speech on Friday night. <laughs> okay, a couple of stick figures looking at the sky and talking to each other. One says, you know, every time I look up at that, that starry sky, I realize how tiny and insignificant we all are, especially you. And the other one says, what? Pardon? Pardon? <laughs> We're all insignificant. There's the seven dwarfs. All we need is a, uh, uh, I guess, a Snow White. Well, gentlemen, we got a lot to cover, as usual, and we've been doing this, and we just love getting together. And I always learn stuff. I'm the guy that doesn't know anything. The hell am I doing hosting a science show? This is crazy. <laughs> Nevertheless, I digress. We're going to have a big board meeting next Saturday, and we're also going to have a Saturday. Uh, you want to give us an update real quick, uh, Chuck McPartland, on outreach for the club? Uh, well, uh, I don't know how much we'll manage with the June gloom coming in here. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have on Wednesday, we have Carp State Beach on Thursday, Bacara, Friday, Refugio State Beach. And then Saturday is the second Saturday uh, Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History Star Party. And we have our planning meeting before that. Right. In the afternoon. And yeah. people are showing up for these events, right? Yeah, yeah we had uh, 119 at Refugio State Beach the other night. How many uh, telescopes usually get set up? For example, at the Star Party or Refugio, dozen. Less. Oh, it varies all over the place. We had five scopes at Refugio. Okay. Well, there's a lot of the old guard I miss. I don't, you know, I had the mazes, and uh, you know, who was the elderly gentleman that was in charge of selling stuff? Uh, Art. Art uh, Harris. Is he okay? Do yeah. Remember? And something was emailed to us from Edgar Ocampo. Was that you, President Jerry, that sent that uh, picture? I didn't get it. I, I, I probably me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Edgar's used to be. He'd bring us our uh, what our root beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the the beer. Hey, the moon in June is crooning a tune. What's going to happen? Okay. Here? This is the moon for June. The phases we are here right today. Okay. Just just past full. Mm -hmm. And um, by next Monday, we'll be well past um, last quarter. So starting at last quarter until first quarter here, this is the period when you have some time of the night that's dark and you can see faint fuzzies or take photographs. So I just hold my breath and wait through this period. <laughs> So that, it's accurate when it says it's a quarter moon, even though it looks like we're looking at half of a full moon. So there is no half moon ever. That's not a word you hear. Right? Oh, you don't see that, but half moon is actually the full moon. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you'll never be able to see a full, full moon, both sides. So as, as the Terminator starts crossing this week, Terminator is going to start coming across, and it's going to cross through. Um, this shows it on the 8th which is Thursday. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the Terminator is right here in Mar Tranquillitatis and that you get good uh, shadow definition on things like this that are in Mar Tranquillitatis. This is a photograph by Robert Casalac from France uh, that he posted on Facebook. Uh, okay. Excellent photograph. I believe he uses an 11 inch or 12 or 14 inch mead mm -hmm. or a Celestron 14, I think. He frequently puts that in there. No, I don't see it. Um, but these two craters are very interesting. They 
appear to be the same age, very similar structure. Um, they don't appear to one to be over the other. So they probably hit around the same time, uh, possibly at the same time. But that shows a characteristic splash pattern out here, which is not real strong here. They're definitely after the Martwang Quilitatis was flooded with lava. They're more recent than that. But these are things that are easy to see. And uh, if you read French. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Yeah, he also, he also take, took this picture under poor seeing of Copernicus, it's which is in the good. middle of the close to the middle. Yeah, he does very At the good. central peak. He got yeah. that central peak. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now, these rays have a lot of little points in them, little, little craters of their own where chunks hit and dug new little craterlets. A lot of detail in that. And that is available later during this week. Interesting sure. parts of the moon. You know, I was about to ask my dumb question of the week uh, as the web zeroed in on it. That I don't think it's possible for the web to look at the moon, is it? It's out past it, isn't it? And it'd have to look toward the sun and get heated up or no, turn it around. No, can look at the moon, but the moon is not the primary purpose that it was made. Oh, I understand that, but I'm just curious what it could see if we could aim the web. Might, yeah. might, it, might it be able to focus down on the landing craft, you know, of the no, lamb. No. You don't think no. it's good to see the lambs, no. All right? We can already see those with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter anyway. It's taken several yeah. pictures. You can even see the, the footprint trails that the astronauts left. Yeah, the, the uh, tire marks they left in the soil. Mm -hmm. Right. This is our um, Night sky. Uh, variable star of the, of the month. Here it uh, comes. La Captain America. It's, it's a superhero <laughs> named La Superba. Uh -huh. the magnificent. <laughs> yeah. So love it's it. located, I put the cursor right on it here. This uh, That reddish star there, it's a carbon star, I believe. Mm -hmm. And this down here is the Big Dipper. I hate all these extra things they add. <laughs> this is the, uh, trying to find a way to get rid of those without actually erasing them manually in photoshop it's stuff but, we should uh, know the what it's stuff we probably should know about that area isn't it no it's irritating oh, okay it's too busy so there's the handle and there's the bowl because you don't really see these lines but the eye the star pattern to me suggests these i can see that there's buddhas and uh this is in the small constellation of canis benetici is Buddhist or Boatus, however you pronounce it, is that close to the big void that has its name on it too? What's that again? There's a big blank space uh, that, that they've nailed down. They call the, the Boatus void. And well, there's a dark well, that's space just, there. That just means it's in that direction in the sky, Ron. So is it in that direction? Is it near Boatus the star or what is Boatus? Well, it's not a star. It's a constellation. Yeah. Oh. See the whole, it's, it's the pattern. It's this asterism. Okay, and so that void would be out there. I mean, they find these big areas that are void of stars. And you got galaxies. to be careful of voids of stars because usually they're just a lot of fainter stars. On this, on this planetarium program, I have the um, magnitude limit set at a certain thing so it doesn't get too confusing with a lot of stars. So the fact that there's an, a void here might not be a real void. Well, and the, other the void, the void you're talking about, the void you're talking about, Ron, is a void of galaxies. It's one of the right. you know well, yeah, spaces that. between the filaments of galaxies. So it's not just stars not there. It's nothing there. I understand that. I just it just had the same name and yeah. it looks like boots, but that's not right. Or Buddhist. It's Boatus. It's got a couple of dots over one of the O's. The second mm -hmm. O, yeah. You know, even in German class, we had a lot of trouble pronouncing things with umlauts over them. <laughs> Well, somebody was named Boatus, Boatus or whatever. I guess it's something you pick up when you're raised in the language. Are we members of the A A V S O? Since we're not, talking about very not that I know of, we would be in our club isn't, but individuals may be. Right. Oh, okay. I used so to this, be. What? What? I used to be. About? I used to be a member when I was a kid. When you were a kid, did you pay mm -hmm. fees? Did you pay a a membership fee? 
You send them money. I don't know if I paid any membership, but I was out in the uh, the cold of Indianapolis watching variable stars. Uh, and those are usually uh, carbon stars too, and they had these very very long cycles like uh, Las Paraba does. And um, you 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 know again, this was all by sight, right? So they and I still have these charts. I still have these charts, and so. The AVSO would send me uh, a series of charts, and then I would look at the charts and the stars that would neighbor the uh, variable star of interest. And from those uh, neighboring stars, you could estimate to a couple of tenths of a magnitude, if you were pretty good, uh, how bright that star was tonight. But again, these stars had cycles of upwards of two thirds of a year to a year. And so oh. they, didn't, they didn't change very much every night. Well, you, you once gave a pretty good speech in front of the club on Cepheid variables, but they're not part right. of this, right? They're different. Somebody. Yeah, those, those are very different stars. And, and, and the Cepheids I studied were, were under another subclass that had very short cycle times. Uh, some, some of them had um, cycle times of a few hours. So they would swell and diminish over the course of a few hours. Okay, those are very special though, Ron. Are there, okay. are there are there more than uh, more variables than non variables? Just like there's more binaries, or are they rare? Uh, variable stars are not rare at all. Uh, I I don't know how they populate, you know, with the regular stars, but uh, uh, they're, they're fun. They're they're a lot of fun to, yeah. to track. Variability variability is a, frequently a stage that stars pass through. Mm -hmm. so That's right. Inherently variable or not variable. This yeah. one um, is in the time range that Tom mentioned. It's 157 days period, yeah. mm -hmm. and it brightens. It goes from a bright of 4.8 magnitude, which is easily seen by the naked eye on a dark night, and mm -hmm. it fades to 6.3 magnitude, which is beyond the naked eye visibility range. So sometimes mm -hmm. the star is there, and sometimes it isn't. Yeah. It's, it's a change in brightness of 75%. So it uh, goes from being 100% of its brightness to 25%. It's wow. really a dramatic change over uh, right. half a year. And, mm -hmm. and it's a carbon star, so it's intensely red. Yeah. Yes. But if there are variables that take centuries to go from one to the, the other, we'd never know it yet because we haven't had astronomy with hardcore viewing that long, have we? Yeah, stars that have periods of question. entry... I don't know if those exist. <laughs> Gary? Um, Gary? Yeah, even the myrotype. This is this sort of a oh, myrotype. Um, okay. And the, the, these stars have periods up to a year. Um, you know, so. So it's not hundreds of years. That's you know. no. I, I don't. I don't think you. You you may get those. I just don't know about them. Okay. And okay. if you did get them, it would take you a long time sitting out back to look. <laughs> okay. And the Cepheids, they're on a different time scale, or they don't, they have no regular somehow the Cepheid variable. We don't have, yeah, they're very regular. Oh, extremely. Regular. Yeah. And they, they tend to be yellow giants, Ron. Uh, you know, a famous example is a Polaris. So our North Star is actually a Cepheid variable. And it's actually doing some crazy stuff lately, you know. Really? It's, yeah. It's kind of going off of its cycle and having little burps and things. So. Um, you know, what these are stars that are aging. They're aging, and so they're getting a little unstable. Okay, including um, big bad betel juice. Yeah, well, that, that's a what, super juice. giant coming up. That's like a super giant, right? Chuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And supposedly, so it's this, ready to go. Okay. Moving right along, this this uh, <laughs> chart. This chart is the southeast at um, ten o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And this shows uh, a smaller, dimmer uh, asteroid, if you want to see it. It's just rising at that time in this rich region of the Milky Way. This is the top end of Scorpius coming up. And um, that is... I was going to say, Jerry, that was where the full moon was on uh, Saturday, one of the clear, rare nights we got. Uh -huh. We watched the full moon. I think it was the front end of Scorpius, you know, the, June, the June moon. This would be later in the week, mm -hmm. March, no, 7. So okay. this would be Wednesday. And I did tick that to get the moon out of the way. 
<laughs> so, and this is the uh, 11 Parthenope. Parthenope. Anyone know how to pronounce that better? Where's the word? I think it's Parthenope, but I don't know. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Slightly off the topic again, gentlemen, forgive me, but that lower in the dark horizon is that's not our local skyline that we have around. No, the, this is a the, generic skyline that's in okay. that um, that I selected that's in the well, planetarium software. If you, ever, if you ever come to the museum and watch a planetarium show, you'll see Santa Barbara on the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Above us. yeah, really neat. They used to have in the Griffith Observatory, they used to have an accurate one of the Los Angeles skyline. Oh, um, really? And out <laughs> along just before the ocean on um, Signal Hill in Long Beach. That was covered with oil derricks and oil rigs. <laughs> and, and, and in the Gladwell Planetarium at the museum, uh, it's, an a, a, you know, the buildings are accurate. Their positioning has some artistic license, but they try to make it look like you're standing in the Rose Garden. And so you see the, yeah. the mission to the west, and then you see the <laughs> Santa Barbara downtown buildings to the east. And uh, there's no Paseo Nuevo though, because it's 1970. <laughs> I thought the Mesa was on the right as you're looking up and kind of the, yeah, if you're here. looking south, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I would have preferred it if they'd have done it from the museum more the planetarium is, because it always like it confuses me when I look up there. Cause... Well, well, well that that uh, particular uh look in the planetarium uh kind of uh, justifies something I've said for years on the radio that. We have a Carpinteria Valley, which isn't really a valley, and the Goleta Valley, which isn't really a valley. They're like shelves. But Santa Barbara is not called a valley, and yet it is. There, <laughs> there it is. There we are in between the Riviera on the left side. <laughs> and that explains a lot of the attitudes here in Santa Barbara. <laughs> <You think? laughs> we just don't well, have I, I always, I always figured that the Goleta Valley was um, a valley that was half full of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is the path of a much brighter um, ah. uh, asteroid path of Ceres during June. We'll be going down through Virgo. It, it, it's coming into the region of a very rich um, cluster of galaxies, the Virgo cluster, but it's also getting very far west in the evening. So this mm -hmm. is going to be disappearing soon. And as far as we know, Ceres is not variable. <laughs> um no it does that, rotate it does have a very bright spot on it so it does, does have a fluctuation in light how okay, many now we're gonna talk. how many dwarf planets are in the asteroid belt was just two or three just or is series. That just oh, series. No. wow you suppose all the rest of them are uh left over from shattered Dwarf planets? No, they're just stuff that never coalesced. Oh. Successfully. Yeah. I mean, a lot of impacts. Ah, here we go. We're going to talk about stars, right? This is good. Classification stuff. of stars. It looks complicated. There's a lot of pictures. It looks like a long talk, but it's really very simple and mm -hmm. straightforward. You don't have to memorize it. And this slide summarizes the whole topic. The way we classify stars right now. Um, this is, is a three-part series called the Morgan Keenan series, MK, mm -hmm. and it consists of three factors. One is the original color temperature color of the star, uh, sequenced and, and defined by Annie Jump Cannon back in the 1800s from Harvard University. And the way they taught me in junior high to remember this was, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. <laughs> uh, was the mnemonic that's sort of politically incorrect these days so there if you look online there's probably a hundred variations of that some of them kind of snarky some of them kind of not <laughs> um, it goes from the hottest that o type which stars can be up to sixty thousand degrees and down to m type which is the coolest type and then they've added a couple of sub dwarf categories too um, beyond that uh m l and t i know the um um, and this this defines the color to the human eye. So this is the um, black body emission peak of the um, ball of the planet, where there's no spectral lines. Um, each class, each of these classes is then divided, subdivided using a numeric digit 
with zero being the hottest. So this kind of goes the other way and nine being the coolest. Mm -hmm. So for example, an A type star, you could have an A8 or an A9 um, and it goes down the form of sequence from hotter to cooler, for example. Um, then there's a third term that's added to that and that's a luminosity class, which is added to the spectral class using Roman numerals. Um, and this is based on the width of certain absorption lines in the star's spectrum of its atmosphere. So um, to distinguish, and it's primarily to distinguish giant stars from dwarves. So for example, the, the uh, Roman numerals are um, O or 1A, class one is for supergiants, class two is for bright giants, three is for regular giants, four is for subgiants. Five is for main sequence stars, our sun is a five. Uh, six or SD for subdwarfs and D for white dwarfs. Uh, the full spectral class, all three things added together, give you the classification, classification of the star. And for our sun, it's a G2V, indicating main sequence star with a surface temperature of about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. So, um, and then it's been every, as everything, it gets tweaked as you go on. So they're adding um, C for car, S and C for, C for carbon star, S and C for carbon star, D for dwarfs on here. So it breaks from the new Roman numeral. Um, so that's basically the whole classification scheme. Now, if you remember from Star Trek, they would classify, they, took over parts of science, but they screwed it up. And so they had their planets labeled as these. So they had a class M planet, which was like Earth. And that's the one I always land on. It's a class M uh, planet. That's where, that's where the Klingons live. It, and humans. Yeah. Why was the humans? Okay. I thought they were not parents. on the same planet, though. Now they're represented by these things. These are two dimensional charts called a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. But as you see, to get all of it right, you really need a third dimension. So it really should be a third dimensional thing. But this is absolute magnitude, which is luminosity. That's how bright it is from a fixed distance, say a, a one light year away. And here's the spectral class, which roughly corresponds to temperature of the surface. And then these different uh, types of stars are all along here. And that represents the third dimension, the um, Roman numeral. And this is another representation of that, uh, more closely to color index, but similar plot. There's many different variations on it. Some of them flip the axis here, so they can get very confusing. But brown dwarfs are not stars, are they? Uh, they're not technically stars. Some stars, some things on the way to stars um, start doing, they burn, they fuse hydrogen but they don't, they don't consistently fuse it. That is, they have a lot of hydrogen, so they fuse it and then it's gone. So then they're, they're not real stars. That's a class of brown dwarf. Yeah, the de deuterium fusing, fusion. Yeah, yeah. But they do so, emanate light. I, I thought they were large Jupiters. No, yeah. a Jupiter emanates light. Brown stars do emanate light, but the light is frequently um, way out in the infrared or um, radio waves. Yeah, Jupiter, Jupiter it emits more radiation than it receives from the sun. Really? It does? And it's yeah. visible radiation that we're no, seeing? No, not visible. Oh. It's mostly radio it's and infrared, infrared, like Jerry said. Oh, I yeah. see. Okay. Wow. But um, uh, that's because of gravitational collapse. But there wasn't enough mass on Jupiter by about a factor of 10 to get the, mass, the temperature, internal temperature, high enough to start fusion. But it's still high enough that it's going to take... Um, billions of years to completely cool off. The, this shows the classification that was originally done by the Harvard computers uh, led by Annie Jump Cannon. Uh, o is greater than 30,000 degrees. Um, we here are at G class and our sun looks yellow. Now the G class is very interesting for astrophotographers because our sun is a G2B and in photography, sunlight defines white. So it gives you the white balance of everything. So what you do when you take pictures, you take pictures in three different bands. If you're doing RGB, red, green, blue photography, and you want to put it together to give something that 
hypothetically would look like what the human eye sees, <laughs> then you need to know the proportion of red, blue, and green. So you find a, RB, uh, a G2V star out in the sky, and you take some pictures of it with each of your filters and making sure you don't saturate, um, or you take one picture with a um, DSLR and you separate it into the three colors. And then the, the brightness ratio gives you the ratio for your camera system and your telescope system of how to put other images together with that proportion to get a natural looking object. So that's as close to, as you can get to how they would look to the human eye. But of course they're faint. And so there's a lot of disagreement about whether that's really valid or not. Well, since we get the entire color spectrum from our sun being a white one or a yellow one, whatever, if we were on a planet around a red dwarf like Proxima yeah. Centauri, would we not see greens and blues? No, they'd just be very faint. Oh, it'd be primarily though a red world, wouldn't it? It would be. It would look reddish, yeah, to our eye. But if you grew up there, it would look white to your eye because that would define the white for that system. Wow. This is from an O-type star. Um, it's not a very good spectrum, but uh, shows absorption lines for hydrogen alpha, hydrogen, or this is sodium, and hydrogen beta, hydrogen gamma, hydrogen delta. So it's, it's um, anyway. Is that from a spectrograph? Yeah, yeah, this is a spectrograph of that star, spectrogram oh. of the star, taken with a spectrograph. I thought it was lines we got from stars. Lines. There's the lines. You can see H yeah, beta there. The see the line coming down? Oh, I, okay. I see them now. There you go. Now, the, the ball of the sun or that star is this continuum of light. The absorption lines is from the atmosphere. Okay. Now, these are um, A type stars, typical. Uh, they grow up in a cluster together, usually stars of the similar type come from the same cluster, not always. So these are A-type stars, so how they look in our photographs. This is a B-type star. This, in fact, is uh, Vega. And uh, this is the sun for comparison. Now, you notice Vega is not round. Hmm. OK. Rapid rotator. Yeah, right. it's, it's rotating so far fast that it's bulging out. As a matter of fact, if it were rotating even a teeny bit faster, it would be throwing off material from the sun. It would be spinning faster than its Roche limit. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably why it's this size, because at this speed, whatever was out here got thrown off. How, how, what's the, uh, the width of that star? How much of this a This is diameter? the sun which is what, 800,000 miles? Oh, I see. okay, Eight, almost a million miles. So that's about three, three so million it's miles. about, yeah. Okay. So I think it's two and a half million, six or something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah. Well, it can only really go so far. If you saw a spot on it, it wouldn't really be just whirring around like a nuclear, what do they call those neutron stars that are turning? Or... No, those things can rotate in a second or two. <clears throat> I know. <laughs> If Vega were to collapse, it would do its ice skater twirl and collapse, then through conservation of angular momentum, it would speed up to those speeds. But here it's million, uh, almost 2 million miles across, and so it's not rotating fast enough to compare to a neutron star, but it's rotating a hell of a lot faster than our sun is. Wow. Our sun is also elliptical shape, but only instrumentally measurable. It's very slightly, it's very, very spherical. And therefore another question, similar to the last question, are most stars rotating or are they all rotating? Pretty much all. All of them, and we can tell. Yeah, you can see because of the Doppler effect in the spectra. Oh, okay, gotcha, right. Can't see uh, star blots or what the equivalent of sunspots going by though from that distance. You, you can on Betelgeuse. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, you can. Wow. This is an A-type star. I, I, don't, I don't remember the name of it. Hmm. Is that the one that would so go this Canopus. Right? Would this yeah. be bigger than the orbit of uh, Mars and all the way out? Oh, wait, to... this is not a... Yeah, this is Canopus. Yeah. A-type supergiant. 
and the second brightest star in the sky. And I couldn't find a good picture of an F star, but they had this dust ring around an F star, closest I could get. But I have no physical meaning for it or identifier. It says dust ring around the class F star. Then we come to class G, which is us, old soul. And um, all class G stars are believed to have dark spots on them or sunspots. Class K is Arcturus. Um, and and the, the sunspots are kind of a sign of convection going on. So in the, in the more massive, hotter stars, you don't have that as much. And that's why you don't see the spots. Yeah. And this is um, a red giant, either Arcturus, for example, shown here, or Antares shown here, which is a very big star. There's the orbit of Mars on it for scale. <laughs> and there's our sun for comparison. <laughs> right, that little dot right there, the pale blue dot. Just impossible to imagine that much uh, plasma going on everywhere. <laughs> you know, and they say what it takes hundreds of thousands of years for photons to jump around inside our little sun. I say yeah. it here. How long does it last inside something like that? I think you can take the uh, diameter and scale them linearly. So, oh, well, a lot of energy there. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's the orbit of Mars inside the damn thing. I love it. <laughs> wow. This now, um, a class M star um, is, for example, Betelgeuse. Oh, is that what we're looking at? Why and this is a, this is an actual image of of Betelgeuse. Okay, is it shaped it's, like that? Yeah, it seems to be blobby. Yeah. Wow. And it's got variation in temperature across there. This is playing. This is an optical illusion. That's playing with my eyes. It's not from the web, is it? No. Uh, no. Okay. No. And and okay. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's going through. It, it was dim for a while, and now it's brighter than normal. It's it's doing weird stuff, and it's changed its period. Yeah, this was the famous darkening, um, what, 75 days ago, half a um, third of a year or something. And well, that's, that's more on the far on the left, because this is oh, oh, higher, yeah, taller is yes. brighter here. Yes. Yeah, this is brighter. So this is darkening slightly and now it's now it's going up this is days before today and today is uh, may 18 2023 and now it's at 142 percent of its usual brightness so, so the magn magnitude on Betelgeuse one is its usual brightness okay it goes a lot it varies a lot it's a, it's a variable star right yeah yeah not a Cepheid variable. And does it ever blink out where we can't see it without a telescope? No. It went down by about 30, or down to about 30% of its usual brightness, I think, just a short while ago. But it was still visible. Yeah, it still stayed visible. And it is part of Orion. It's the shoulder, right? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Wow. 142%. Look at that. This is this is data that was taken. These are not vi visual. These are not images. These are artist conceptions of a hot spot blowing off, cooling down, becoming dark, and then rotating in front of the the Betelgeuse and causing the dark period we had. And from this, they developed models of what is going on. And some of those models are quite success, quite I think, very accurate. And this is this is the result of those models. It shows per year from, and this is the zero is the time when it becomes supernova. And so these are um, elemental compositions. This is oxygen 16. The black line over here is the one going down is he, um, hydrogen one. The gray going up is helium four. So here it's changing from hydrogen burning to helium burning. The helium goes down and it's picked up on oxygen burning. And here it went through a period of carbon 12 burning. And so, um, and this is um, 
inside its mass fraction in the whole planet. So, and then it comes on with here, it'll have a brief period of neon burning, and that will, these will all suddenly collapse as the thing becomes supernova, and you'll get a lot of silicon 28 forming in the uh, explosion. Do you think so they'll be able to? Do you think they'll be able to predict it? By this is the this is the prediction of what the the compositions will be. There's no prediction about when zero occurs in our date. So, and also you can't you can't you can't really measure this until you get the explosion and 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 it spreads this out because this is deep inside the star, so you right. don't see these spectral lines or anything. This is all just theoretical. Really, this is, this is a test. Uh, coming up, we won't know the, the results yet, but it's a test of how accurately our models of star formation are. And this is uh, sort of an average of three different um, um, models that were developed. Well, of course, inquiring minds want to know, uh, at 640 light years away, if it were to happen and we could see it, would there be any danger to us? Could the stuff be propelled here beyond the speed of, no. well, it doesn't go beyond the speed of light. The light would get here, but anything solid that could hurt us would take a long time, wouldn't it? Yeah, and it wouldn't go that far. Oh, so we wouldn't be in danger. We'd just have a nice light show even during the daytime, wouldn't we be able yes, to? Yes, we yeah. would. Yeah. Now, if you have something like this go off, um, these hypernovas, if their rotational axis is, toward, is pointed towards us, then you could get bad news from X-rays and gamma rays and things, but not so much from Betelgeuse. Its, uh, it's rotational axis doesn't point at us. <clears throat> okay, that's those spearheads on the pulsars you're talking about. Have you ever gotten in the line of yeah, sight? Yeah, similar to that. Okay. As gamma rays and X rays are light rays, they're just going super fast. They're not super fast, super frequency. That's the difference. Interesting. All right, what do we got here, President Jerry? This is a shift that's a dusty place out there. This <laughs> is uh, the Andromeda Galaxy photograph of the dust in the Andromeda Galaxy from the James Webb. I think it's from. Uh, no, this is from the Spitzer Space Space Telescope. It shows mm. cosmic dust in uh, interstellar dust, actually, in the galaxy. The dust yeah, yeah. is classified by where it comes from and how it forms and stuff. And we'll get to that, touch on it briefly. This is an artist's conception of dust being formed in a supernova. These are blowouts of dust. That is molecules that have combined to form minerals and... Uh, uh, some organic compounds. They're not identified in that picture. Okay. This shows this shows interstellar dust in our galaxy. This is from the Hubble, I think. Yeah, yeah the Hubble Space Telescope. And this shows um, typical dust clouds in our in our uh, galaxy. And you Another name for them is molecular complexes. So that tells you yeah. more, you know, about the yes, size and dust. And you can see a lot of internal structure in here. I think I believe a lot of that is due to a very weak magnetic fields defining flows. It's not just free of um, every every interaction except gravity. So well, now these are the abundances of different elements in dust. Now there's there's these elements in atoms, but that's not what they're measuring. They're measuring lumps of things that have, the red ones are lumps that are morphologically smooth. The blue ones or whatever that is, the teal ones are morphologically porous. And the blue ones are large coarse, like sand grains. We get a lot of these um, every day on earth. We get some hundred tons of this stuff coming down. We see it at night as meteorites, small meteorites. <clears throat> or meteors. Yeah, meteors, yeah, as long as it's dust. Or they're meteoroids. Yes. Yeah. Meteorites they, are when they hit the earth. But no, meteorites are afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, meteors are what you see at night. Okay. Um, so this is a, abundance 
Um, and these scales are 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, um, 1, 10 to the 1, and 10 to the 2, or 100. So um, it's density. And there's not a lot of carbon. There's a lot of nickel, a lot of iron, chromium, calcium, sulfur, aluminum, magnesium, sodium, oxygen and carbon. You said there's not a lot of carbon. I thought carbon was very predominant throughout the it, universe. It's it's um it is very common. These are all very common, but these are more common than this. Really? As far and as being you, a component of these dust grains. Yeah. So up here in order to be more common, it has this one is by far the most common up there, calcium, coarse calcium. Um, calcium also references here, carbon references here. So uh, these going way down, these are, are very, very rare. So would it be safe to say, gentlemen, that uh, when you say calcium, that's a bunch of calcium atoms either floating freely by themselves or clumped together in a calcium dust particle? No, these don't. These don't mean crystals of calcium. They mean something like um, uh, you'd find on Earth a, um, what are those called? Crystals, <sighs> not crystals. Yeah, crystals, but no. Um, um, Mineral grains. Minerals, thank you. God. See, there's <laughs> the foggy brain again. Minerals. <laughs> well, so, yeah, um, reason. These are minerals that contain a lot of things. For example, you can contain uh, nickel and iron and water oxygen, um, and you can find these things together. They're not pure elemental dust grains, but these are dust grains they've caught that the compositions are measured in. We'll get to the catching them in a minute. There's a lot of ways to uh, catch them. Catch them? Catch them. Are we trying to? Are we got a probe out there going we after them? Yes. No, you, yes. you just send up a U2. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> really, in the upper atmosphere? Yeah. Okay. So these are um, types of interplanetary dust particles, and the um, it's an elemental path how they progress from dust in the solar system formation period to an organic interplanetary dust particle today. So they start out with chondritic, iron, sulfur, nickel. Uh, that would be one of the minerals. Mafic silicates. They go through uh, the chondritic ones go through carbonaceous. Um, an ordinary and enstatite, and they produce um, carbonaceous types of organic molecules. So they they evolve as they are in this in space and subject to radiation, subject to heat, uh, light, and subject into running into other particles in the clouds. These clouds are not terribly dense, and they don't run into each other all the time, but they do make it. This is an example of a dust particle that is porous. Porous, meaning? And, yeah, this is a porous chondrite dust particle. Meaning it would hold water or? <laughs> no, it just no. means that it's got lots of gaps in it. Oh, I see, okay. And the, the background it's on is a collection pad from, um, we send up aerogels in panels in satellites and they fly through, they stick out their paddles and they fly through dust clouds or they just fly around and whatever they pick up, then they bring it back to earth. We've done it, the Japanese have done it. We've caught a lot of these things. And this is the small dust grain stuff. This is a one micron, which is um, 10 to the minus six uh, meteors. Um, meters. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, and they, they go up with U2s just even into the high atmosphere and they have you know, suction where they suck in the ambient air and then they run it through these filters and collect this stuff too. Right. So when you see, you hear um, um, atomic or chemical and, and dust clouds or atomic clouds of hydrogen and dust, these things are in there. It's not a, it's not a pure um, element. But so we're this, not seeing... We're not seeing individual atoms or molecules no, in these no. photographs. This well, also is on the same scale. This is a smooth chondrite interplanetary dust particle. Another one captured by one of these satellites that goes up and digs them out. 
but you also find these things. Now, this, this if it hits the Earth's atmosphere, would probably burn up before it got to the ground. But uh, so they go up and get them. But these things can be captured. Um, there's a range of methods to get these. This is called cosmic dust, and it's by remote sensing, which means that you look at their radiative properties in turn through looking at the zodiacal lights, for example, or bouncing radar off them. Um, there's directly in situ varieties of collecting these things from different locations. Um, the earth receives somewhere around uh, five to 300 tons of these things every day. Jeez. NASA also collects samples of stardust particles in the Earth's atmosphere using plate collectors under the wings of stratospheric flying, air, flying airplanes, which is what Chuck mentioned. And then uh, dust particles are also collected from surface deposits on the large Earth ice masses, Antarctica and what Greenland in, our, in, our, in the Arctic and deep sea sediments. Interstellar dust particles were collected also by the Stardust spacecraft and samples were returned to Earth in 2006. And those are the ones that we saw there. So now you know what cosmic dust is. Well, a couple of follow-up questions, Mr. President. As long as it's a conglomeration or a compound of all kinds of elements clumped together like this, it's dust. How about just bare ass elements by themselves little molecules maybe that, of, happens, um, that happens too they're okay. chunks of ice pure ice pure ice yeah because water molecules which would be h2o can they can they just do they clump together usually or do they can they in, the, in space two molecules can come together and how how hard they come together defines what happens because they can come together so fast and they hit each other so hard, they just bounce off. But they can also hit, and if as they're close, if they're hitting at lower speeds, there's different ways that they can chemically bond. Um, and uh, so they stick together. And as often as not, a brand new solar system or stellar system is created with the explosion of another star that compresses these gas clouds together. It, that starts the compressing together right every, there's no other everything reason. everything that was in our sun and in all our planets was once made up a gas cloud a gas and dust cloud and the first ones were just pure hydrogen and pretty much weren't they at the very yeah. beginning yeah. hydrogen and helium yeah hydrogen a tiny bit of lithium and beryllium and perhaps they hit the ground running apparently after the big bang because i've seen reports that there are suns that are located that are 10,000 solar masses. Uh, that's that's damn big. Yeah. And big things like that burn through very fast. So they did hydrogen to helium very quick and then helium down to other atoms and stuff. So they made a lot of metals very quickly. Well, all the elements above iron get made at the very moment of explosion, don't they? Yes. No. No, no. The, some get some get made in a supernova explosion, but later when neutron stars collide is when you make more of the heavier, heavy elements. Mm -hmm. well, there's a title for you. When neutron stars collide yeah. by Anthony, no, Robert Antonici. Yeah. <laughs> Playing well, at your local theaters. This is not the same dust that we, that we get under the couch, though. That, that why some of it, some of it is. You think so? This stuff don't, is sifting down through the atmosphere and yeah. landing on the ground. So don't clean that coffee table. Well, the I don't only think there's... thing that's it. The only thing that's under your couch that is not in space is cat hair. <laughs> <laughs> the coins and the lint you'll not find out there. Yeah. Well, as usual, gentlemen, I have learned a lot, and uh, we are going to invite everybody to uh, Saturday night's big star party. Hopefully, it'll be clear next week, and. Uh, We'll see you guys again on the screen in the afternoon before that for our big meeting. And well, the meeting yes. is on the same night as the star party. That's true. Yeah. But can anybody that wants to join the meeting sign in with us? Sure. They want? Or can you it's they it's meant for members, vote. but uh, yeah. Can, can they watch? It's not like now we're on YouTube, but that we don't do that with our. We don't YouTube it, no. 
No, all right. All right, well, let's talk again next week, and uh, that'll be number 121. This was 120. Take care of yourselves. Don't get any remnants of COVID, and we will see you at an outreach party or one of our first Friday monthly meetings that may now be in Fleischman Hall from now on. You never know. We'll see. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, thank